Okay, good cousin, as the Kabanari would say, we're at lecture number 12. We're almost halfway through with this course, my friends. All right, last time we were together, we talked about the Decembrist movement. This took place, of course, in Russia. It was in 1825. You know the story about the Decembrists here, which rose up against the uh, uh, conservative government under Nikolai I. They were demanding that Constantine, the liberal brother of, Const of uh, Nicholas I, be appointed as the Tsar. All right, and the uh, uh, leaders of the Decembrists were, of course, hanged. You know that in Rome broke, but they were rehanged, and if you can understand what I'm talking about with that, and we mentioned also about France and Louis Philippe, Louis Philippe, and after three days of barricades and rioting in the streets of Paris in 1848, Louis Philippe abdicated. He'll be followed by an election to take place here, and elected as president of France was that of Napoleon. You know that, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. All right, and we talked about him declaring himself as temporary dictator, then dictator, and then finally he crowned himself as Napoleon III with his wife, Wojeny, by the way. All right, then we went into socialism and communism. You got very familiar, I hope you did anyway, with Friedrich Engels, interesting individual from Germany, from the Rhineland, if you will, and the condition of the working class in England, uh, yes, which describes the misery of the workers in the textile mills there. Oh, and we also talked about Karl Marx, Karl Marx with the Rheinische Zeitung, and an interesting individual there too, uh, had attended school at Berlin, and had been banished from many, many of the countries, to include the Rhineland, by the way, his own home area. All right, then we went into a section here on nationalism, a sense of belonging. And if we take that and we put that emotion into uh, action, if you will, we get into nation building. And that's where we're going to go today here, folks. We're going to create a couple of nations along the way. And we threw in, for a good measure here, a little bit about romanticism, imagination, freedom, if you will, individualism, and so forth. All right, so let's build some nations. How about that? So let's go to our documents camera and see where we're going to go here, folks. And I want to start, first of all, with that of Austria, uh, you might call it the Austrian Empire. It is, of course, controlled by the Habsburgs. We've been through that time and time again. It has uh, many areas uh, under its control. Three major areas, however, and we've talked about this a little bit before, was that of Austria. We also have Bohemia. That's where the Czech Republic is located today. Uh, Hungary, which is right next to the Czech Republic. All of those areas are very, very beautiful, very fun to visit. And I'll share a couple of things with you about that as we go through the class period. Try not to beat you up too badly here, folks. But I'm going to tell you, if I haven't mentioned this, and maybe it was last semester I did talk to you about it, if you go to where the Austrian Empire was, it's a multitude of various cultures. It's very, very challenging to try to bring everyone on board with the Austrian Emperor. We have a multitude, like I said, of ethnic groups, multitude of languages that are spoken there. And uh, I think I told you this before, but if you go to the area of the Czech Republic, Bohemia today, you can stay there for a week and never learn a word. It is just the craziest language that you've ever seen before, unless you go to China or unless you go to Hungary, because Hungary is the very same way. Stay there for a week. Beautiful place here, folks. You know, a lot of good restaurants, a lot of good pubs, bars, if you will. You know, beautiful scenery there and but uh, but nevertheless you won't understand very much uh, you have to let them uh, be able to communicate with you in English all right so if we move right along here like I said, in Austria, you had many different ethnic and language groups that were there. We had people that spoke German. That wasn't difficult, to, difficult in unifying people that are Austrians or any of these people that spoke German. That was no problem. But the problem came from the Czechs and from the Magyars and Magyars, or the Hungarians, if you will. Uh, you had Poles, you had Slovaks, you had Serbs, you had Slovenes. You have, I can't read my writing there, folks. And anyway, I can't even read that. That's upside down. So I'll have to just let that go to your imagination. Italians, Italians, that's what that says here. And in 1848, a number of things took place here. Much of this dealt with a, a uh, shall we say, a reverberation of the uh, uh, revolution that took place in France, which led to the abdication, if you will, there of Louis Philippe. And for the first thing that's going to happen is that Hungary will separate from Austria. The person that is behind this is an individual known as Laos Kothen. 
Lauskasi, if you look at the word Laos, can you pull from that, if you will, Lewis? Can you pull from that, Lewis? And uh, he is like the uh, George Washington to Hungary, by the way. And I'm going to come back to him in just a second show you a few photographs of him. But I wrote up the top here. This is a major city here, which is found in Hungary today. It's called Budapest. Most of you are probably familiar with Budapest. I'm going to go back to myself here in a second here. But look at the two words before I switch to uh, the camera on me. Buda and Pest. There are actually two cities that are present there on either side of the Danube River. Some people refer to that as the Donau River, but the Danube River, beautiful area, by the way. You can take the Danube River and go all the way from the Black Sea and take it all the way up into Germany. It's an interesting, fun, fun trip if you wish to do so, and I recommend that you do so. And in fact, I'll even go so far as to recommend Viking River Cruises, a wonderful experience for you folks. If we ever get back to traveling again, you know, uh, maybe you can work that into your busy schedules there. But what I was trying to say is that in the area where Budapest is, there are two cities. On one side of the Danube River, we have Buda, and on the other side of the Danube River, we have Pest. But through the years, with the two cities there, and closely linked by several bridges, to include the Chain Bridge, and you'll love the Chain Bridge when you go to Budapest, but through the years, the two cities just joined their names of Buda and Pest and created Budapest. All right, interesting, interesting place to visit there. A lot of history there with the Magyars. So let's go back here, and I wanted to, I promised you I was going to show you a uh, likeness here, uh, Louis Cotham. And first of all, I'll show you the one that's in your textbook. This is on page 707. Uh, here is what he looks like. If I can get my textbook, go back further enough anyway. Louis Cotham. And if you go there, like I told you, he, was, he is a recognized, if you will, is he uh, literally the George Washington? Let me get everything organized here because I knocked it all around. And but anyway, if you go there today, right there in Budapest itself, uh, this is uh, right next to the Hungarian Parliament building, right there. And if your eyes are sharp enough, you can even read down there, Katsitz, Katsitz, right there. So you see the statue there of Los Katsitz. Uh, like I said, to keep beating this up, he's like the hero of. Uh, of Budapest and Hungary. All right, also in this time in 1848, Bohemia, that's where the Czech Republic is today, developed its own constitution. Uh, we're going to see a number of riots to take place here. And in fact, the, uh, the emperor there of, of, of um, uh, Austria, he won't abdicate, but he's an old individual and he will literally flee for his life and go into sanctuary elsewhere. He'll come back later. And we also find uh, Italian liberals will attack the Austrian held territory in Italy. I really, well, let me go back to the camera here because we're going to be going to Italy on a number of occasions in the uh, uh, next 30 minutes or so here, folks. But where the Austrians controlled was up in this area here of the Italian Peninsula. And that's where we're going to see some liberals to clash with the Austrians there. And they, they're not really all that successful, but it just uh, it just adds to the situation that we have in 1848 in Austria. It is not very stable there. But I will tell you this, that the Austrians will gain control of all of those areas within a year. All right, so anyway, we'll move right along here, folks, and let's address a couple of other areas here. And like I wrote here, uh, Within a year, Austria will regain control. So, shall we move right along, my friends, and this exciting lecture here on revolution and nation building. And uh, this is kind of interesting group, and, and a lot of people kind of get a bad view of Slavic individuals. We, uh, we get to have a tendency here to think of the Slavs as uh, not very well educated, you know, uh, lowbrow type people, you know, their eyes are a little bit too close together. And uh, a lot of people take a bad image of the Slavs, and I take offense with that. Now, I'm not Slavic by any means that I know of, and I've had DNA testing on me, to, uh, uh, and none of it is ever shown up that I was Slavic, but uh, but nonetheless here, you know, they're quite interesting individuals here. You go to the area of the Balkans, and I don't have a map behind me to show you where the areas are, such as Slovakia, Slovenia here, Bosnia, uh, neat, neat places to visit. Let's go back to the camera here, folks. And for, uh, for the Slavs, they have a tendency to be united. They're united in language. United in culture, uh, sometimes it's referred to as Panslavism, as P-A-N, Panslavism, or in other words, all Slavs. This would include individuals that are Russians, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Croats, Serbs, 
Bulgars from Bulgaria, obviously, Magyars, Montenegrins, a neat, neat country to visit here, folks, small country, but very fun to visit, the Montenegrins, and the Bosnians, and the Bosnians. And all of these individuals share pretty much a common language. All right, they use an alphabet, which is Cyrillic alphabet here, you know, which was developed by St. Cyril, we talked about last semester anyway. And if you understand one of those languages, like Russian, for example, if you're a Slovene or a Slovak, you can communicate. Now, it may not be, it would be, here, here's my interpretation of it. It would be about like uh, Americans understanding British English. Uh, you know, there's a little bit differences in dialect, a little bit differences in accents, but it's the same basic language. And what I've been told by tour guides in that area anyway, is that for these tour guides that are Slavs, you know, they will put on a resume, you know, I speak 10 different languages. And, of course, they're immediately hired. You know, I speak Russian, I speak Polish, I speak Czech, Slovak, I speak Slovene, I speak uh, the language of, the, of Croatia, I speak Serbian, Bulgarian. And, of course, they're quickly hired with that. And there's not hardly a nickel's worth of difference in the languages of each one of those. Uh, a little known news here, folks, and you can't use that in the future, I'm sure. Okay, so let's move on. I want to switch to another country. Country, one of my very favorite countries, my own homeland there, Ireland. Ireland. Ireland had long had disputes with uh, English domination, uh, English domination, Protestant English domination over the Irish, and the Irish were quite resistant to this. One of the individuals there that's so well known, and I do want you to recognize this individual, often recognized as the liberator, often recognized as the emancipator here. He would later serve as the first Irishman to be elected to the House of Parliament, by the way, in, uh, in London. So that's quite an achievement there. This man's name is Daniel O'Connell. And here, friends, I'm talking about my homeland. My ancestry is more Irish than any other Irish and Welsh, if you will, and Scottish here. And if you get a chance to go to Dublin, Ireland, Dublin, Ireland is in the Republic of Ireland, not in the Northern Ireland. Uh, it is a very, very strongly Catholic area here, uh, all in the Republic of Ireland. That's the southern part. But I uh, take the opportunity to uh, cross the Liffey River. Uh, people there refer to it as a Sniffy Liffey because it has a little odor to it anyway. But cross there and you'll see there the statue there of Daniel. Come. The liberator, if you will, the emancipator. If you go right down the street here, let me get myself oriented here. And let's go down the street on the opposite side here and down a couple of blocks there for those of you that are literary, uh, have a literary interest, particularly in uh, English uh, writing or in Irish writing, you'll find a statue there of James Joyce. James Joyce, one of my favorite individuals, by the way. Uh, amazingly here, here we have another photograph of uh, Daniel O'Connell there, a little bit closer view of that. And how would you like to have this as a legacy here, folks, when you can't see it here in a photograph, but when when you go there, the uh, head and shoulders of Daniel O'Connell are completely covered in pigeon mess. So that's your legacy in life here, folks. You do everything you can, you know, to try to liberate Ireland, you know, from the stronghold of the British. And that's your payback there, folks. You get pigeon mess all over your head and shoulders for the remainder of your life. Seems like somebody go up there and clear that, but obviously... Somebody does not. Okay, so anyway, and Ireland will be unsuccessful. Where am I here? Ireland will be unsuccessful in achieving their independence at that time. Don't despair. If you are Irish, you will get a chance later on here, folks, and I'm talking about towards the end of the course, where we will get the independence of Ireland. So let's move Ireland right along and see what else we need to talk about. All right, this is going to take a couple of uh, uh, hits here, folks. I'm going to talk to you right now about the beginnings of uh, Irish uh, excuse me, beginning of Italian unification. And it's going to take a while for us to get there with that. Uh, Italy was made up, and, and we're not today, but it was made up of many states. Some of these are like city states. Uh, let me, let's see what else I have here. And I, I want to share these with you here. I'll give you the names here. Lombardy, Venetia, Sardinia, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, and the Papal States. And I'm going to tell you, good people here, it is even more extensive than that. So let's go back here to my map here. And... I get my microphone over here where you can hear me a little bit. I'm going to turn away from this. 
and show you where these two, where these many, not two, where these many, many city-states are and areas are of Italy. They're still recognized by those terms today here, but they are not separate states or separate uh, nations today. If we go up to the top here, we have the Kingdom of Sardinia. Here's the Kingdom of Sardinia, which is here. This part today is part of France. Uh, this is the island of Sardinia, which is part of Italy today. You have uh, Lombardy, which is present here. Venetia, which is present here. Uh, this is Parma. That's, that's a portion here of Tuscany. Modena. Here's Tuscany itself. We have the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. That's the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which would include where Naples is located, where Sicily is located. And then we have the Papal States. That's the area that the Pope himself actually controls. It, it's a country. It's a country at that time, you know, and it's just referred to as a papal state. Now, there's no unification of Italy at this time, and that's what we're going to try to do here, folks. We're going to try to bring about a unified Italy, and what I want to do is introduce you to a person here who was a leader, uh, one of the principal leaders of an organization called Young Italy, and they're going to attempt to unify Italy in the 1830s here. Now, what this comes from, this is the branch off if you will, of the Cabanari that we talked about earlier, the charcoal burners, if you will. All right, and led by no other than a person by the name of Giuseppe Mazzini. So let's go back to my camera here and let you see how to spell Giuseppe Mazzini. Giuseppe Mazzini, let's get the lighting adjusted properly here. And as I shuffle through the pages of my textbook here, i tell you what I'm going to, well, I'll get it under the... Uh, under the documents camera here and it will probably knock all of my slides off to the side there but it looks like i'm gonna be able to pull this off but there it is with uh, giuseppe mazzini here okay and uh, interesting leader there of uh, young italy young italy is what it is known as and in 1834 giuseppe mazzini mounted a raid and i better go back to my camera here folks and was leading his uh, young italy uh, uh, military group and he actually came out of Switzerland here, came out of Switzerland, let's get the camera up here so you can see this, Switzerland's located here, and actually invaded, if you will, this area of the kingdom of Sardinia. And they were unsuccessful in doing this. And for Mazzini, he is just, just too radical. All right. And so he, he's, he, that's going to be the end of that revolution that takes there, takes place then. Now, I want you to look at the name here. And I always try to help you good folks out with words. And Giuseppe, Joseph, Giuseppe, if you will. And if we look at the name here, his last name here, Mazzini. All right, now, uh, I want you to think in your mind, pizza. Pizza. P-I-Z-Z-A. Pizza. Well, we don't pronounce it a pizza. We pronounce it pizza. So if you see the two Italian letters here, Z and Z, it is pronounced as T. So hence we get the pronunciation here, Giuseppe Mazzini. Giuseppe Mazzini. Put a little star by him here, my friends. You will see him in the future. I like him. Okay, so let's move on here. And let's uh, make an attempt to uh, create a nation here in Germany. And it's going to take us a while to do this. Nation building takes a while. It just doesn't happen overnight. And what's going to take place here, folks, and you, you remember now, Germany has not been created. We just recognize it like an area here. And the principal city-state that is found in Germany is that of Prussia. Prussia is over to the uh, eastern side of where Germany is today. We don't recognize it as Prussia. We can recognize a unified Germany. But uh, let's make an attempt here to uh, try to uh, create a unified Germany. And in 1848, everything happens in 1848, the Frankfurt Assembly takes place. It takes place in May of 1848 to try to determine if we can create one, one special and single Germany itself. So yeah, let's see what's going to take place here, folks. And uh, assembling here were 871 delegates, and where they assembled was a place which is called St. Paul's Church. If you're following in your textbook, I'm looking for a page for this, and I do not see this. So uh, it's actually on page 704 in your textbook, but I'm not going to show you a uh, artist rendering of St. Paul's Church because I have a better likeness of it here. And this likeness here is what? St. Paul's Church looks like today. So in May of 1848, 871 delegates gathered there at St. Paul's Church to determine, do we want to create a Germany? 
Do we want to create a unified Germany? So let's move on here, folks. But the question arose here. And let me get my slides adjusted properly. But the question arose here. Oops, I'm in the wrong place here. Uh, who were the real Germans? Who were the real Germans? And you actually had two groups, two factions to break out of this. And one group, which they referred to themselves as the Great Germans, the Great Germans would be the uh, Gross, Grosse Deutschland, Grosse Deutschland. And for the Great Germans, they felt like that uh, anybody that spoke the language of German, anybody that had German culture, uh, if we all have a, a kind of a, a joining geography, joining boundary there, then those individuals should be recognized as Germans and great Germans. But then we had another group, and this was a group that was to the north. And this group was very much opposed to the Austrians, very much opposed to the Habsburgs' influence. And what they wanted to do was to uh, exclude all Habsburgs. Uh, even though they spoke German, even though they had the same German-style culture, geography, adjacent areas anyway, but they wanted to exclude all of the Habsburgs. And crazily enough, it was this side, the Kleinisch Deutschland, the small Germans, the little Germans here, that actually one out. But we're not going to get a unification of Germany at that point. And the reason for this is that we're going to see an influence that's going to come from Denmark. Now, Denmark is to the north of where Germany is today. It's a tiny country, as a matter of fact. But the German, excuse me, the Danes began to uh, mistreat some Germans that were located in the area of northern Germany, which is called Schleswig. We'll talk about Schleswig at later times, too. And just uh, the Germans in Schleswig felt like that they were being mistreated and that the assembly was just not uh, giving them any attention with that. And so, crazily enough, the assembly dismissed. It just broke up. So this attempt in 1848 to create a unified Germany just did not take place. Don't give up. Before the end of the class period, we're going to create a unified Germany. All right, so uh, let's move on here, folks. From 1850 to 1870, uh, we're going to see intense nation building to take place, particularly with that of Germany, and particularly with that of Italy. So let's continue our approach here, my friends, with uh, Prussia or Germany. And uh, this individual, and I want you to recognize this individual, and his name is uh, Otto von Bismarck. Often he's referred to as the Iron Chancellor, the Iron Chancellor, and he became the Prime Minister of Germany in 1862 at behest, if you will, at the request here of the German Kaiser. Now, if you look at this word, and this is your first exposure here to Kaiser. Kaiser means emperor. Kaiser means king. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. The king in question here, the Kaiser in question, is that of William the First. William the First. William the First. Let me get something to drink. And he was the uh, Kaiser from 1861 to 1888. Uh, we have quite a bit to talk about with him at a later time. And also his uh, his, his his son, or I think his grandson, Wilhelm II. Uh, but anyway, and he appointed Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, as the Prime Minister in 1862. And I want to tell you a little bit about Bismarck. Bismarck is a no-nonsense individual. He is a Prussian. He is a Prussian. He very well recognized in World War II. There was a German battleship by the name of Bismarck, by the way. It's an interesting story in itself. But Otto von Bismarck was a practitioner of real politics. This is heavy, heavy-handed tactics here. Hard-headed reality here. It's uh, like my way or no way, and that's just the way that Bismarck was. I want to play the music the way it sounds good to me, or we're not going to play it at all. And that's just a typical attitude there of Otto von Bismarck. And what Bismarck's going to do, he's going to put into motion to build a German empire. And this German empire is going to be created in eight years here, folks. So there are several wars that will help Bismarck to achieve this goal of a unified Germany. So let's move on here and identify some of these wars. And I want you to recognize these. Uh, we had, first of all, we had the Crimean War. This Crimean War took place in 1854, 1856. Uh, I'm working out of my office right here, folks, to prepare your lectures. So I don't, I, the only thing, I have a short space to work in here. So I just take the more important maps and put those maps behind me. But if you were in classroom right now, I would demonstrate this on a European map. And it would be a lot clearer to you folks here. But this war that's going to take place here in 1854, 
1856. It actually began a year earlier in 1853, but it's not going to bring all the European nations into this war until 1854. But it begins in 1853 when Russia actually attacked, uh, actually invaded Moldavia and Wallachia. And I wish I had you in class where I could show you where those countries are here, folks. Uh, think in your mind here where Romania is located. And if you can picture Romania and the Black Sea, that's where Russia actually invaded uh, Moldavia and Wallachia, which were part uh, of what was called the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire is controlled by Turkey. All right, now, when Russia invaded Moldavia and Wallachia. Of course, this uh, this triggers a war, Russia against Turkey. Well, as the Russian army began to approach the Danube River, the one I talked about a few minutes ago here, when they began to approach that area, then this alarmed the Austrian Habsburgs. So the Austrian Habsburgs jumped into the war on the side of the Ottoman Empire in fighting Russia. And then shortly after that, France jumped in, England jumped in, Sardinia jumps in. And what we literally have here, we have almost a world war that's taking place as many of these European nations were going against Russia. Now, where this takes place is where the uh, Crimea is located today. It's in the, it's in the Black Sea, which, by the way, the Black Sea is not black; it is brown. But anyway, now you have some more useless information there, folks. And the war just uh, dragged on here. There was uh, I don't know if I wrote this out for you folks, but there was terrible mishandling of uh, medical supplies, terrible mishandling here of a uh, supply. There was a lack of hygiene, and thousands of soldiers literally charging in great great numbers across open areas and charging into the face of death, if you will. And it was, it was just a real bloodbath. Here, I did write it down here for you. You know, there was poor supply, poor hygiene. One of the principal battles that took place there was the Battle of Balaclava. The Battle of Balaclava. This is one of my favorite, favorite uh, sections to uh, discuss here, folks. So uh, let me share a little bit with you on this with the Battle of Balaclava. And uh, you may be familiar with the English poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, or Lord Alfred Tennyson, and he wrote this poem, which was called The Charge of the Light Brigade. It's one of my favorite poems here, my friends. Perhaps you are familiar with it, and I'll share it with you here if I can get it positioned right here. And I'll share it with you folks, and I'm having to read this at a, uh, at a disadvantage here. But The Charge of the Light Brigade, half a league, half a league, half a league, onward. Road the, uh, well, I can't read this too far away. Road to 600. Forward the light brigade. Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death. Road to 600. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's not but to do and die. Road to 600. Or, or into the valley of death. Road to 600. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon in front of them. Volleyed and thundered. Uh, stormed out with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death. Into the mouth of death. Mouth of hell. Road to 600. All right, the charge of the light brigade offered Lord Tennyson. I want to share a couple of likenesses here with you. We did have photography at that period of time here, folks. This is not a photograph, but if you're in the classroom, I would have these articles out here showing you the uniforms that the soldiers wore during that period of time. It was just a bloodbath. All right, on we go. Here's a couple of other uh, likeness is here. This is showing you the charge of the Light Brigade, an artist rendering of the Light Brigade. There actually was a battle that took place there in the Battle of Alaclava, uh, which was represented in the uh, in the poem there by Alfred Lord Tennyson. More photographs here uh, showing you some images there of this uh, uh, Crimean War. Okay, so anyway, the war is finally going to come to a close with the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Paris, 1856 here. All right, and Russia would be defeated here. Okay, so, uh, and, and by the way, as a result of that, we're going to see these two countries here, Moldavia and Wallachia, will now become the country of Romania. All right, and that's where it stands today. Interesting place to visit, by the way, if you ever get the opportunity to visit Romania. Go up into the area of Transylvania if you wish to do so. Okay, there were a couple of other wars that are going to take place here that will assist Otto von Bismarck in achieving Germany, as a unified Germany. And here we go here, folks. We have another war here, uh, which is called the Danish War. This war took place in 1864, and which the uh, Prussians 
if you're Germans, Prussians, you want to call them that, uh, actually took control of this area, which is called Schleswig and Holstein. That's a North German area there that it uh, borders uh, Denmark, by the way. We had another war that took place in 1866, which is called the Seven Years War, and Prussia defeated Austria in this Seven Weeks War. If I what did I say, Seven Years and the Seven Weeks War. All right. So anyway, so let's see here now. Let me show you a, a likeness here of Otto von Bismarck, and there he is right there. This is a statue. Otto von Bismarck is like, you know, the George Washington for Germany anyway. Uh, this photograph was taken in Berlin, by the way. It's over on the, uh, I guess you would say, the western parts of Berlin. And uh, and by the way, here's Bismarck in the center there, and he is not covered with a pigeon mess, by the way. So apparently there's no pigeons there, or apparently, you know, somebody cleans that mess away. I just don't know. Uh, over to uh, both sides of here where the the woods are. Uh, that, that's a tear garden, by the way. Some of you may be familiar with the tear garden if you uh, uh, read about Nazi Germany much. And also in that area, and this is kind of interesting too, if you uh, continue down the uh, street there, it's called the Unter den Linden. Unter den Linden. And uh, that's under the linden trees. And those are linden trees at my fingertip <coughs> here. And you'll see this uh, huge column. In this column, it's called a victory column, by the way. You can see the uh, German traffic there. Uh, it's a multi, multi, multi-lane road. Uh, I, I cannot even begin to describe the size of this victory column. Uh, you cannot even get across the streets here, folks. All of the pedestrian traffic goes under the streets, and you can actually come up to where the victory column is and climb up the victory column up to about this level right up here. Tremendous in size. Did I write that? The height on it, 220 feet, 220 feet from top to bottom. But this victory column was established after the Danish War, after the Seven Weeks War, and then uh, after another war that I'm going to mention to you in a few minutes. All right, it was all during the times of Bismarck, by the way. So it's a, a magnificent tribute to the victories that the uh, Prussians achieved uh, during that period of time. Okay, so shall we move right along here, and let's see what else we have. Now Bismarck. Well, following this, following those wars that I just mentioned right there, Bismarck will consolidate the German states that are north of Austria. And Austria is going to be excluded from this. He will refer to it as a North German Confederation, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for that. But let's move on with another war. And this was a war in which Bismarck actually provoked. Bismarck provoked this war with France. The title of the war, it is referred to as the Franco-Prussian War. It takes place in 1870. 1871. And I'm going to tell you, good folks here, it was not much of a war as the Prussians just literally rolled over the Franks here. And no contest whatsoever. See if I have some numbers here for you. The French lost 150,000 killed, and for the Prussians, they had 28,000 killed. And oddly enough here, the Prussians actually captured Napoleon III. Napoleon III, who was, of course, the Emperor of France. They captured him and uh, sent him out of France and sent him out of Europe. And uh, he actually was sent over to England, which is not on the continent itself there, you know. So a magnificent victory there for the Prussians. So I want you to think about this now here, folks. Remember, we've talked about this on numerous occasions here, about the palace at Versailles the Chateau de Versailles. And sure enough here, Otto von Bismarck, on the 18th of January, 1871, you don't need to know the date, but I want you to know what happened here. On the 18th of January, 1871, at the Hall of Mirrors, which we will talk about at another time, but not today anyway, at the Palace at Versailles, Otto von Bismarck proclaimed the German Empire. And now we have created Germany here, folks. We have created Germany. Did I, write, I did not write it out for you, but all the German states now will all swear allegiance to the Kaiser Wilhelm I here. Germany has been created. Austria is excluded. Austria will remain as Austria. It will not be a part of the German. Empire. Okay, nation building. We built Germany. So, shall we move right along here and let's see what else we have. I want to go back and and refresh your memory here, my friends. And let's go back to my map here. And I want you to look at this map here of Italy. Refreshing your memory on this. Italy was made of a number of city-states, so to speak. We had the Kingdom of Sardinia. That's a major area that's present here. We had Lombardy. We had Venetia. Parma. Modena. 
Tuscany. But all of those areas are under control of the Austrian Empire. Even though they're on the Italian peninsula, they're under control of the Austrian Empire. So how in the world can we get a unified Italy if the entire northern part here is all controlled by the Austrians? Austrian Habsburgs here. So we're going to have to make some arrangements here to uh, to uh, eliminate the Austrian presence. And there's no way that the Italians have anywhere near the military might that they can ease the Austrians out of that area. Now, they would be easily defeated. The Austrians are just too strong. But if we could get an ally, if the Italians could get an ally, and they're going to do so in the form of of France. Now, the person I'm going to talk to you about is Napoleon III. Now, Napoleon III was captured in the Franco-Prussian War, so we're not to that point yet. We're still about oh, 10 years away from that. So what's going to take place here is in Sardinia, here's Sardinia, which is present right here, and Sardinia is going to send a diplomat to sit down firsthand with Napoleon III. And what he's going to try to do is to make a deal with Napoleon III that if Napoleon will agree to use the French army and join that French army with the Sardinian army, and then they can attack the northern parts of the Italian peninsula and remove the Austrian presence there. And Napoleon agreed to it. Now, there's no free lunch here, folks, so the French are going to get something in return for this. And what they get, they'll get this area here, which is called, I'm trying to find it here, this area here, which is called Nice, and this area here, which is known as Savoy. So Savoy and Nice will now be traded to, or given to France for the use of French military forces. All right, so I need to go back to the camera here so you can identify with a, a very important individual. And that negotiator that's going to do this, who was an officer in the Sardinian army, his name is Camillo de Cavour. Camillo de Cavour. And he sat down with a secret meeting with Napoleon III and made the arrangements for what I just told you about. That was in 1869. So when the French army and the Sardinian army go into the area, they are able to take and secure that area for what would later be Italy. But that still leaves us some, some areas that are out here, folks. We have the Papal States that are to the south. Let me go back to my camera so you understand this fully. And we're going to have the Papal States that are to the south right here. We also have the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. So they are not included in the northern part here. So what it is paramount for us to do, we're going to have to take and secure those southern areas, the area of the Two Sicilies, and also that of the, uh, well, the area of the Two Sicilies and, and, and the Papal States. All right, so the way we're going to do this, we're going to have an Italian... And let's go back to the camera here. There's an Italian, here we go here. And this person, his name is Giuseppe Garibaldi. He is like, and I hate to keep using this phrase here, folks, but Giuseppe Garibaldi is like the George Washington to Italy. And what Garibaldi did, he took about a thousand red shirts. That's what they all call, they call themselves, the red shirts. And while you're kind of copying that down, I hope you copy these things down here, folks. And let me try to show you a likeness here. Uh, Garibaldi, and there he is. See if I can slide my book here under my camera. That's what he looks like. Notice the red shirt, by the way. A thousand red shirts here, and this thousand soldier army will go south, push out into the area of uh, uh, the two Sicilies itself, and they are going to be successful. And they will be successful in taking control. Now, what could have happened here is that Garibaldi could have just declared himself as a king or the leader of the kingdom of the two Sicilies. But that's not in the cards here, folks. And what he ended up doing, he offered, he made an offer to the king of Sardinia that if the king of Sardinia wanted these areas of the kingdom of the two Sicilies, then he would turn that area over to them. And the king agreed to do that. That was Victor Emmanuel, by the way. He agreed to do that. So when we take the southern areas and the northern areas and bring them all together here, folks, that creates a unified, almost a unified Italy there. And Victor Emmanuel II will become the king of Italy, a unified Italy. The one area that still remains here, folks, but we'll get to that in just a second. So let's catch up on our notes here. Giuseppe Garibaldi, I want you to recognize that name here, folks, and he joined with the kingdom of Sardinia, and we are going to 
create Italy. The king of Italy is Victor Emmanuel II. That will be one of your test questions, by the way. As king, He was king of Sardinia, and now he becomes the king of Italy. Today, if you visit Rome and go inside the Pantheon, you'll find a burial site there, uh, a tomb site there of Victor Emmanuel II. King of Italy. King of Italy here. One thing remains here, folks, and I tell you what, I'm going to wait for just a second before I do this. Uh, here's a likeness here. This would be on the bulletin board. Here's a likeness here of Garibaldi. That's what he looks like. Not in his red shirt, of course. And we'll see who else we have here. Here's another likeness. This is in another city. The cities that you go to in Italy, most of those cities will have statues of Garibaldi. Uh, it's just uh, Garibaldi Street everywhere in Italy. You know, it's just uh, Garibaldi. And... Here's another likeness. This was taken in Sicily, by the way. Uh, Trapani, Sicily. And you can see a likeness there, Garibaldi. Uh, I'll say it redundantly for about the fifth time. The George Washington to Italy. All right, now, what remains here, my friends, I'm going to go back to my camera for just a second here. What remains here, we want to adjust the lighting on it, is this area here, which is the Papal States. That is the area which is controlled by the Pope. Well, nonetheless, here in 1870, Italian military forces went into the Papal States and they took control of all of that area, including Rome, including Rome. So that brings about a very, very unified uh, Rome, a very unified Italy. So what is the Pope going to do? Well, he'll have a little hissy fit about this, my friends, and the Pope will go into seclusion and isolate himself, and his followers will isolate themselves in Vatican City all the way up till 1929 here, folks. All right, today when you go to Italy, you'll find that the... Uh, there's there's pretty good relationship, you know, between Rome and the Vatican there, or the, uh, I should say Italy and the Vatican likewise. All right. Okay, so let's move on into a different topic here for a few minutes here, my friends. A uh, different topic. We're going to be talking about uh, a different chapter, too, by the way, imperialism and also colonialism. I'm almost through, so don't, don't uh, uh, get too impatient with me here. All right, but we need to define some terms here. And uh, before we get into this, uh, the, the definitions of imperialism and colonialism, and they're not difficult to understand here, we're going to find in this section here, we're moving into a new era, a more modern area, which is sometimes referred to as a European era. It will last from 1870 to 1945, uh, which, of course, we're going to get into some major wars here, World War I, World War II. Four empires will be created. And unfortunately, we're going to see four empires to be destroyed before it's all said and done. We're going to see the emergence of mass politics and culture. More and more individuals will get the uh, right to vote. And ladies, you're going to get the right to vote in many of these areas too. And like I said earlier, this will also include World War I and World War II. Okay, now a major event that takes place. And this event will take place in the 17th of November in 1869. And I want you to pay attention to me on this because this is this is important for us. Now, I don't have a good map behind me here, my friends, so use your own imagination. If you were traveling from, say, uh, by, by boat and going from England or going from France and you were traveling uh, over to India or to China, this means that you have to go around the southern tip of Africa. That is a long, long way. So what's going to happen here, folks, and it's going to shorten the distance by a half anyway. In 1869, on 17th of November, the Suez Canal opened. Uh, we had 68 ships to pass through the Suez Canal. The first ship that passed through was a the, the, the uh, Royal Yacht, which is called Eagle. And on that ship was the French Empress and Empress Eugenie, that was the wife of Napoleon III here. 68 ships passed through. Included in that, we had the Grand Duchy of Russia. Uh, we had the Crown Prince of Prussia. We had the Emperor of Austria. It was just all these dignitaries that were present there. All right, and so the British are going to control the Suez Canal. I don't have a photograph of the Suez Canal for you good folks to, uh, to see anyway. Uh, I've seen the Suez Canal. I've actually traveled under the Suez Canal as you go through a tunnel and go up in, in Egypt and actually go under the uh, under the Red Sea. You go under the Suez Canal there. And what the Suez Canal is, it is literally a ditch. It is not constructed of locks, if you know what I'm talking about with that. 
that is just a uh, sea level ditch that just cuts through right through uh, that part of Egypt itself here you know very successful here anybody that controls the Suez Canal you know you'll have a lot of power here folks and for the British the British control 40 percent of the shares of the Suez Canal but in 1882 some Egyptian officers led by Rabi Pasha now Pasha is a not a name Pasha means like a military rank like general it'd be like General Urabi and they took control temporarily of the Suez Canal and the British lashed back and I'm telling you folks they lashed back vehemently under General Garnet Wolseley and for the next 70 years the Suez Canal will be controlled by Egypt it's going to play a big deal in what we uh, what we address during our next time together here folks so let me give you the definitions here before we close out here and if we want to describe imperialism, that is the extension of one state's control over another, using economic, political, and military power to obtain advantageous treaties or terms of trade. That's imperialism. In other words, we take over the country. We take over another person's country here. All right, now we can break this down a little bit. And we can also include in this what is called colonialism. Now, colonialism is direct control. This can be referred to as formal imperialism. This means, uh, okay, I'll use an example here when North Vietnam took over South Vietnam. Instead of using South Vietnam indigenous leaders there, North Vietnam went in to complete control of South Vietnam and established a communist nation. All right, now, opposite of that, we can have indirect rule. This is an agreement with indigenous people to allow them to still control their government but under our direction, our direction. I think good, uh, uh, good examples of this indirect, indirect rule. When the coalition forces went into Iraq, when the coalition forces went into Afghanistan, we kept indigenous leaders in place, but they were answering to the coalition forces. They were answering to the United States. If you understand what I'm talking about with that. All right, that's the difference here. Colonialism, uh, which is direct control, indirect rule. Uh, the opposite of that. And we will close out with this, folks, from 1870 to, eight to 1900. France, Great Britain, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Japan, Russia, and the United States will colonize 20% of the land's surface on planet Earth here. And this is what most people don't realize here. And that's the direction that we're going to go here, folks, in our next uh, couple of lectures. We're going to go in and we are going to, in the United States and these other European countries, and not the United States in the areas I'm talking about right now, but these European nations will go in and they will lay claim to China, they will lay claim to uh, uh, Egypt, and lay claim to much of that of Africa. In fact, 98% of Africa too. That is colonialism. That is imperialism. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. I appreciate your attention here. Stay up with your material. We're well on our way to our next examination. Okay, thank you.